Good morning, uh, dear participants, to this very exceptional format of the Green Week 2020. COVID-19 has transformed even this, I would say, really uh, very much love the recurring uh, appointment uh, for everyone interested in latest environmental developments into something that is less human uh, touch based and less cozy than we all would have liked to. Nonetheless, a lot of efforts have been deployed to secure that we can make these sessions as constructive and engaging as possible. I'm really delighted to uh, be able to give you this morning a little bit of a context and hopefully uh, spur further your enthusiasm to be here in the first ever session on river restoration across the EU. Why are we discussing this topic here? Well, first of all, let me give you the broader context. Uh, I, I believe I'm speaking to an audience of rather well-informed colleagues, but you may all know that Europe has the most fragmented rivers in the world. European rivers are very highly fermented with an estimation of one barrier per kilometer across the EU and around one million barriers in total. And you all know that according to the Water Femme Directive, the all-encompassing piece of EU law that regulates also river continuity, well, it, this directive says that river continuity needs to be restored. It does not necessarily require the removal of every barrier, but we have to ensure that these barriers can be overcome, bypassed, I would say, through fish passes, fish ladders or other techniques. Also, the Water Framework Directive requires member states to achieve good status for all water and, uh, in this context, the barriers that are needed for certain purposes, hydropower generation, agriculture, flood protection, navigation, need to be progressively adjusted in such ways precisely as to allow fish to migrate upstream and downstream and sediments to flow. For the bar those barriers that are not serving any purpose any longer, the removal should be considered. And the second very important reason why we're discussing the topic today is, of course, that the EU biodiversity strategy adopted in May this year, and which is at the center of this year's session of the Green Week, has now set specific targets for member states to enhance their efforts in implementing the Water Frame Directive legal requirements and to restore at least 25,000 kilometers of free-flowing rivers across you by also removing primarily obsolete barrier. Now, we know how fragile fresh ecosystems are. Between 1970 and 2016, freshwater species populations have suffered an 84% decline, 84%. We have lost almost 90% of global wetlands huh, in the world, including riparian and floodplain habitants since nine, since 100, and, sorry, I should rather say uh, 1700. So in the last uh, 300 years, 90% of wetlands lost across the planet. Since the adoption of the Water Frame Directive in Europe, you know it dates back to the year 2000, the status of European waters has improved, huh? and we currently have 40% of European surface water bodies in good or high ecological status or potential. This is definitely not yet enough, uh, because we know that the global goal for the European member states is to achieve good status across all their surface and ground waters, with the maximum legal deadline of 2027 set down by the Water Femme Directive. Now, with freshwater ecosystems being one of the most affected types of ecosystems on Earth, and with the dramatic decline in aquatic biodiversity I was just referring to, of course, this goal enshrined in this piece of law dating back to 2000 to achieve good status for all our rivers, all our lakes, all our transitional and coastal waters, and of course, all our ground waters from which we extract the largest part of the water we need for drinking purposes, becomes more important than ever. You may know that according to recent studies, there are almost no remaining free-flowing rivers in the EU. Therefore, these targets of 25,000 kilometers set in the biodiversity uh, strategy 
is not only a necessary but also a very realistic target based both on past trends and a large number of ongoing and already finalized projects in Europe. The data that are available to us show us indeed that a significant proportion of the still existing barriers on our rivers are old and no longer serve any purpose. And this is why we focus primarily in the communication of what we call the obsolete barriers, many of which are situated on non-navigable smaller rivers. When it comes instead to the many barriers on Europe's largest navigable rivers, these are typically not seen as obsolete, huh? and, but they're rather in the process of being adjusted. And of course, we want to gauge with you to see what else can be done to secure that they are properly adjusted and transformed into the type of more sustainable design uh, on which uh, this commission is very much engaged. Now, um, the restoration of aquatic ecosystem yields many benefits, not only in terms of water quality and quantity, but also in terms of other ecosystem services. Huh? And you know them all, climate uh, change uh, mitigation next to adaptation, flood defense, amenity value, so somehow touristic value, water retention, coastal protection. They all accrue, of course, to our society as a whole. In this dedicated session this morning, we will focus on the protection and, and renaturation of, a, of this particularly sensitive ecosystem, our freshwater ecosystem. And I'm delighted to be able to have this morning with me some of the best experts, because these are people that have really been working on the ground, have a lot of practical experience to share with you. And we will start with Professor Carlo Garcia de Leanis, who will tell us how a more efficient restoration of stream connectivity and the 25,000 kilometers carway can be really scientifically uh, achieved. Uh, Professor Carlos Garcia de Leanis is the principal investigator and coordinator of the AMBER project and also professor of aquatic biosciences and director of the Center for Sustainable Aquatic Research at the Swansea University in the UK. Professor, I'm really delighted to now pass the floor to you. The floor is yours. So much. Um, I don't know if you can see the slide. Can you see my first slide? Professor, loud and clear. Perfect. Great. Okay. So uh, thank you so much uh, for that very nice introduction. So what we are going to cover, what we want to cover today is how do we go from broken rivers to blue rivers? And I'm going to present some of the results of the Amber project. So we're going to start with a question. What defines a river? What defines a permanent river? Well, what defines a river is that they flow. So rivers are meant to flow, are meant to flow from headwaters to the sea, from source to sea. Uh, not just a few, but all of them. This is what defines a river. That's what healthy rivers are about, are rivers that flow. But the situation, unfortunately, is very far from these you know, uh, ideal that we all have of a river. Most rivers actually don't free flow. And we know that now much better than we did before because of the Amber Project. And the results of the Amber Project suggest, as you have previously pointed out, that they may be in excess of 1.2 million barriers in Europe's rivers. That could be as high as 3.8. So we really don't know for sure. What we know for sure is that there is at least 0.74 barriers for every kilometer of the river network. And that is at least one order of magnitude greater than the fragmentation that we observe in the United States, that we observe in China, that we observe in the India, that we observe in Brazil. So I think that it is very clear that by far Europe's rivers are probably the most fragmented rivers in the world, which is not good news, of course. However, when we look into more detail at what is causing this fragmentation, we find something which we think is remarkable. More than 65%, in fact, just under 70% of these barriers are very small ones. They are less than two meters in high. And when we actually look at how many of these barriers are actually out of use, they are obsolete, they are no longer serving any purposes, we estimate that they may be between 10 and 15%, roughly about 13%. 13% of obsolete barriers translates to more than 156,000 barriers, 
which are not serving any useful purposes and uh, are barriers that could and should be removed or at least mitigated. So, how are we going to do that? Well, one thing which I think is very important to remember is that contrary to popular belief, perhaps, what causes fragmentation is not really the height of the barriers. This is not the main problem. What is really fragmenting our rivers is the sheer number of them. So fragmentation is by and large not determined by the height of the barriers, it is determined by their number and also by their location. This is data that you can see there on the left hand side is the possibility, that is the probability of success of one particular fish species, in this case the European minnow versus barrier height. And I, if you can see there, there is virtually in this experiment no minnow was able to overcome this particular barrier when the height was more than 35 centimeters. Generally speaking, it is true that the relationship between barrier height and barrier impact is one that follows perhaps a sigmoid curve, so beyond which there is a point beyond which the impact is pretty much the same. And in this case, generally speaking, we think that that could be around four meters. So it is not important whether a barrier is five meters or a hundred meters in the big scheme of things. What is important is how many there are. So <clears throat> what does that mean in practical terms? What means in practical terms is that fragmentation in Europe's rivers is an example of death by a thousand cuts. And I think it's important to realize that while perhaps large dams may draw most of the attention, it is actually the small structures that are causing most of the damage. We are talking about uh, ramps, we are talking about the sluices, we are talking about weirs, we are talking about culverts. Okay, these are often neglected and these are by far the structures which are fragmenting our rivers. So, what is the strategy then? How can we overcome this big problem? How can we achieve these 25,000 kilometers of free flowing rivers by 2030? Well, we advocate a two pronged approach. There will be no point and it will be, it will be sterile to reconnect rivers if we keep fragmenting them. So the first thing we need to do is to stop fragmenting them. And then what we need to do is to reconnect. But first, at the same time as we reconnect, we need to hold further fragmentation. And in order to reconnect, it makes a lot of sense to target those barriers which are out of use, which happen to be also small structures, because these are going to be much easier to address. And also any actions on these barriers is going to be more socially acceptable. So how do we do that? Well, we would like to propose a system that we call the Blue Rivers approach, where we would encourage, we should encourage citizens to take back ownership of the rivers and a system where we should monetize free flow. In other words, a system, an approach that should emphasize the positive aspects of the Water Framework Directive and perhaps move away from the stick. Use the carrot, not the stick. And with that, I just have to thank all the people who have worked for the last uh, four and a half years in number and uh, just direct any interested parties to our Let It Flow magazine where you can find a lot of very useful information. Thank you so much. Professor De Leanis, a big, big thanks. I, I trust also on behalf of all the um, people who are listening to us because your presentation is super clear, contains very clear, simple, short, sharp and crispy messages. And I'm sure we will get interesting questions later on. Now, with even one minute of anticipation, I'm so proud about that, I'm happy to pass on the floor to Professor Kim Harestrup. She's a scientist at the National Institute of Aquatic Resources and scientific advisor for local authorities in Denmark. And we will zoom into how to remove barriers out of a very practical example happening in Denmark and how this brings benefits back to society as well. Professor Arastrup, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Veronica, and thank you, Carlos, for the introduction. So there's a lot of things I don't have to say now, but I also have a lot of other stuff to say. So I'll just get right to it. So what is the approach that we've done in Denmark? How did we end there? And what are the results of the outcome? So as a biologist and with 20 years of experience, when we start uh, investigating river life, there is a multitude of species. 
And of course, we can't investigate them all. So what we do is that we look for model species. Uh, we look for model species because if model species, or you can call them indicator species, if they are, are thriving, then the rest of the uh, ecological uh, quality in the rivers will typically follow. In Denmark, one of that we use is typically the anatomy salmonid. I've put in the Atlantic salmon life cycle here just to illustrate it. So essentially what happens here at the bottom uh, part of the figure is uh, salmon in fresh water. So they, um, they spawn in uh, fast flowing rivers with relatively low water gravel on the bottom. The eggs hatch, the juveniles grow in the rivers for a period of time and then they actually change appearance and that's if you look at the number five that's smolts they actually adapt to life at sea migrate to sea and actually completes the growth phase there and then returns back to spawn and completes the life cycle the point here is that it requires some habitat and fresh water and it requires a movement of fish both to go downstream but certainly also to come back the next point here is, of course, that no chain is stronger than the weakest links in terms of barriers or in terms of other impacts. If you break that, they cannot complete the life cycle. So what happened in Denmark is a story to be told in many countries. We have seen pollution, dredging, uh, dredging straightening, and of course, dams and weirs. I've seen put in some examples here. Uh, the point there being that uh, that has led to a decrease in the population across the board. Um, not only eradication of species, but certainly also a decrease in numbers. And if you look in the classic literature in Denmark, you will find titles like uh, uh, Funen, the island with the lovely trout streams, but no trout. Or you can also find, if you talk to some of the older people, the classic statement you'll find is that you'll essentially see was much better in the old days. And maybe it was, I'll come back to that later. So essentially, what is it actually that we're talking about here? Well, we're talking about the two st stages. We're talking about connectivity challenges. We're talking about that fish has to go both up and downstream to complete the life cycle, at least if you're migratory. And also certainly in terms of downstream, I'll come back to that a little later, uh, they need to actually be able to pass. Now, Traditionally, you will, most of you will probably know that there have been a lot of uh, studies and a lot of uh, work done in terms of getting fish to move upstream, at least in terms of salmonids, but they actually have to come downstream. And on top of that, there's a lot more species than just salmonids. They're good for this particular country and the model species, but there's certainly also other species to care, take care of. What I've shown here is a table from some of the back catalog in Denmark, where I've shown studies we've done at water mills, fish farms, or hydropower stations, and you can see the mean small loss. These juveniles that migrate to sea is from 30 and up to 82%. Now, the take home message there is, of course, that they need to pass more than once. As Carlos mentioned, the number of barriers is actually phenomenal. And if you have an 82% loss at the first and 82% loss at the next, there's less than 10% of the fish that's surviving. The fish will simply not be able to complete their life cycle. The other part who has largely been forgotten, at least until recently, is that when you put in a barrier, you actually change the condition, at least upstream. And I tried to illustrate it with a figure at the top right here, where you can see if you put in a weir, and you'll actually flood or inundate an area upstream where you'll change the conditions. What will happen is that the flow will go down. There'll be a lot of uh, uh, sediment falling in to the bottom. And that means that this uh, habitat that uh, salmonids will use and a lot of rheophilic uh, current loving fish uh, uses for spawning and thriving will disappear. And of course, that will depend on the gradient. The lower the gradient, the bigger an area you're actually using. And just as a table I've set in here for some of the Danish rivers, 25 to 40% of this vertical habitat loss, the gradient is actually taken out in barriers before we start talking about passage. So very, very important uh, to consider. And we actually have rivers in Denmark where there's virtually no vertical habitat left. So with that in mind, we were pretty obvious that 20 years ago, we had some straight up recommendations based on the science that you need to remove the weirs, the dams, because you need to reinstate both connectivity and habitat if you want to have a full effect of this. So turning to what then actually happens is that 
we have actually succeeded in removing some barriers, not everywhere, but some places. This particular example here is from River Gudenau, the largest river we have in Denmark, where we took out a old hydro barrier in 2008. And you can see down to the left, you can see the inundated zone and you can see the same site after. You can see that the gravel is now out and you can see the water is flowing faster and, and it's actually much, much better habitat for, for these model species. So what happens is we investigate that. We do that by electrofishing. We go out and estimate. And this figure shows that we the data we have back from 1997 and, and onwards. And you can see immediately after 2008, there is a massive explosion of these yearlings, these fry, because the spawning and, and rearing habitat is now suddenly available. That certainly also spreads further out into the river. So it has an impact also further downstream and certainly also further upstream. So that was on the specific side, but it also straightens out if you make these access in terms of continuity, if there are more habitat further upstream that they were unable to access before, you'll see the same effect. Now, how does that translate into something that we can actually use? It's nicer that it's all these small fishes. There is actually that these fish at some point will go to sea and come back as larger fish where you can actually use them. And as an example for this, we have River Villestrup, which we have followed a number of years. So essentially, we have numbers back from 1999 where they electrofished the river and caught eight fish. In 2004, when the pollution were taken out and some of the smaller, really small berries were taken out, there was about 300 fish. And then they started a major project to remove uh, almost all remaining barriers in the river. And they took out the lower most important one between 2004 and 2009. And when we estimated, we ended up, to, we ended up with uh, about 1,200 fish. And then they took out the last uh, five in the remaining period up to 2013. And when we investigated that in 2016, we were up to 3,600 uh, uh, fish. Uh, so that's actually somehow uh, equivalent of 250 adult sea trout per kilometer. That's like one adult seater per four meter river. And they have a mean length of about 49 centimeters. So it's like 1.5 kilo fish. This has, of course, spurred a very large sea trout fishing, not only in the river, but certainly in the coast. Uh, like coastal fishing for sea trout is like a national sport. Uh, and Maya Fjord, where the river runs into, is probably one of the best uh, rivers we have, or one of the best fjords we have, maybe even in the world. So... One of the take home messages is that it is now much better than the old days. You can hear people saying that up and that now. So we have right to reverse this trend and it is in fact possible, but you have to remove the barriers. Another overall conclusion is that fish don't read books. You can read a lot of literature about how to get the fish upstream, but they haven't read them. They also have to come down. I also have to say that this increment, increment and this improvement doesn't come without us sacrificing. We can't have it all. There is no such thing as a free lunch. And the general idea is that if you are serious about biodiversity loss, you need to make a revolutionary change. You need to take some barriers out. I'm very aware that a lot of barriers cannot be taken out, but we certainly need to carefully select and remove the weirs. Otherwise, we will never be able to reverse the biodiversity loss and help the conservation status. And as a side effect, of course, realize the inlet fisheries potential that is actually hidden in the rivers of Europe. Thank you. Professor Varastrup, thank you very much for the very, very telling story. Um, may I simply say again to the participants that we will engage with you later on in around 50 minutes of discussion. So please use the participants question uh, box that you see in front of you to submit compelling questions you may have even, you know, when listening to the various presentation. We have a team of colleagues that are working already now to select, you know, some of the most prominent ones and we will try to reply to the best of our skills. But now it's time to move from beautiful Denmark, even a little bit upper northern to Sweden and to zoom into a very interesting story, a story of cooperation between the hydropower industry, NGOs, uh, local communities. Uh, and this is all in the name of a project which is called Life Connect. 
Now, may I give you the floor, Professor, uh, Mr. Ivan Olson? You are the project manager of this uh, interesting experience, and we are very curious to hear what you have learned by cooperating together on this one. Please move us to Sweden. Thank you very much, Veronica. I'm uh, honored being invited, giving this very short presentation about Life Connects which is a multidisciplinary uh, 10 million euro uh, life project financed uh, by the program, of course, and the beneficiaries, um, who, who is uh, a nice mix of different authorities, NGOs, the hydropower industry and academia. Uh, life Connects is one of the most ambitious river restoration projects in Sweden started 2019 and will continue until 2025 with the major objective to restore about 500 kilometers of rivers. And uh, that includes the, the removal of a number of hydropower dams and constructions. And this will have positive effects on ecosystem functions such as connectivity thereby increasing the biodiversity and improve the conditions for a large number of migratory species and amongst them the Atlantic salmon and the European eel. Ecosystem services uh, that will follow those measures conducted by Life Connects is predicted to annually yield about 2 million euros um, uh, yeah, around five years following the restorations mainly in terms of the increase of fish populations, but also uh, due to the fact we will have an increase in tourism industry in the surrounding areas of the target rivers. On this slide here, you can see on your right hand side, the locations of the, the rivers that we are working in and on your left hand side, an illustration of conditions before and after a major dam removal planned for in Renault River. And uh, as you can see, the objective here is to get a functional floodplain and full connectivity once the dam removed. This specific dam will be uh, removed in 2023, but following my presentation, Johan Tillman from Uniper will give you another hydropower removal example which has already been carried out successfully this year in the Mörumsund River and as part of this project. And to somehow summarize this short presentation and based on the work that I have done in Life Connect so far but also uh, based on the work that I have um, uh, accomplished uh, uh, during my previous years as project managers for river restoration project, I um, can conclude that academia has been playing an extremely important role, not only for conducting research, but also for being the platform for transparency and credibility. The scientific approach being the glue, keeping the project together, along with other stakeholder groups, such as the industry, NGOs and authorities. And the final goal here is to transfer and replicate Life Connects elsewhere in Europe, using experiences and results from the project, as good examples illustrating how we can improve river connectivity together. And I believe my dear fellow speakers, Yuan and Pao, who is coming up next, will agree to that. So uh, thanks again. Thanks you for your, your attention and um, see you sometime. Bye. Thank you so much, uh, Ivan. And indeed, delighted now to give the floor to Mr. Johan Tillman from Uniper Energy Sweden, uh, operating in the hydropower generation area as well. Mr. Tillman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Veronica, and thank you, Ivan. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this session. Uh, I will talk a little bit about one project that is a part of the Life uh, Connect project uh, that Ivan mentioned. But before I do, I would like to put this in a wider context. Uh, 
The power company I work for, Uniper, is a worldwide operator uh, present in more than 40 countries all, all over the world with a total installed capacity of 37 gigawatt. Uh, when it comes to hydropower, we are operating hydropower in, in Sweden and Germany. And as you can see, um, in Sweden we have more than 70 power plants all over the country with a total installed capacity of 1700 megawatt. Uh, the river in focus today is a river in the southeast part of Sweden called River Murum. It's a fairly small river compared to the others, other rivers that we operate. And the power plant in focus is Maria Berg that you can see on the upper picture, uh, which uh, illustrates how the situation looked before this summer. Uh, it's a one of our smallest plants uh, with slightly less than one megawatt installed capacity. We also operate another three power plants in the same river. Uh, what you have to understand from a Swedish perspective is that hydropower plays a very important role in the, in the energy system, both in Sweden and Scandinavia. It's by far the largest renewable energy source and um, it's also uh, necessary to regulate the grid and the increasing uh, uh, volume of volatile power that is being introduced in the energy system today, mainly wind power, as you can see in the graph to the right. Uh, at the same time, we have to reach uh, objectives when it comes to ecological status in the in regulated rivers which includes enhanced morphology, connectivity, and the availability of habitats that Kim mentioned before. And uh, in order to reach these objectives, the power uh, industry in Sweden has raised a fund of 1 billion euro, which can be used for enhancing these, uh, these uh, very important uh, issues. Uh, the river Murum itself is uh, uh, M2000 area in the low, lower part of the river. It is a river with high biodiversity and also many red listed species, which has to be taken into account. It's also famous for world class salmon and sea trout fishing, as you can see on the lower picture. Uh, we have a long history of measures in this river, uh, not only in Maria Bay, but also in the other power plants that we operate with fish waste and uh, habitat restoration, for instance. And as I said, Maria Bay Harry Power Plant is one of our smallest. It's a first from the sea, uh, and it used to be a bottleneck for ascending and descending uh, migratory fishes. Uh, so what has happened uh, during the summer? Uh, well, uh, we could, or, or something about the background first. Uh, we could also see that it is it, it's possible to achieve an improved ecology in the river uh, with a fairly limited loss of renewable energy by taking out the dam and the power plant. This is, of course, uh, a drastic measure and an exception for, for us, uh, as this was uh, not an obsolete dam, but a still profitable dam. But we believe that it was motivated in, in this particular case. Uh, as you can see in the left picture, uh, when the dam was still in place, this part that is marked in the picture was uh, removed, uh, which you also can see in the middle picture. Uh, the work was carried out behind coffer dams in order to avoid turbid water for the downstream. And you can see the final result in the picture to the right. And you, as, as, you, as you understand, uh, we now have free passage up and downstream but we also have a totally restored habitat in a very important part of the river where salmonids and other organisms can reproduce and grow. Uh, things in focus in this project, the, the removal itself was quite quick and not technically uh, challenging, but it has been a long process to get a license in the environmental court. We have been working with this for about five years uh, things in is, uh, issues in focus has been things like hazardous sediments and turbid water that I mentioned before, but also the risk that fish or mussels should be stranded when we brought down the upper surface. 
so this is something that we have taken care of that you can see in the small picture. Uh, another thing that you might not think of is that uh, the real estates along the river can be affected in different ways by uh, uh, erosion, instability, wells, and piers, etc. And this is something that we as an operator have to compensate for. So those things have been very important to handle during this project. Uh, finally, what has been achieved? Uh, well, I should say first that without the long history of partnership along the river, this would not have been possible. I think that was a very important success factor. We now have free passage up and downstream uh, for all present uh, species, but we also have cumulative effects further upstream in the other power plants. We have a restored habitat in a very important part of the river, lower part of the river. We'll a limited loss of rene renewable electricity, but still loss. Uh, the project has been communicated in different ways through uh, social media, webinars and visits, and I think Paul will say something more about that. Uh, but also important is that we have built up and shared competence and experience when it comes to dam removals with our partners within the Life Connect project and with the universities and researchers that have been involved. Uh, the project has been uh, financed by Uniper, by the partners, and the Life uh, Connect project. So I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank you for this uh, contribution and hand over to Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Tillman. Indeed, allow me just to say a word to present Pau. Mrs. Pau Fernandez Garrido works for the World Fish Migration Foundation, which has played indeed a, an important role as an NGO in this specific project. But I trust she will also give us a bit of a broader picture. Pau, the floor is yours. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today with you. I would like to start with a brief intro explanation first of who we are. So our foundation, Wolfish Migration Foundation, was created in 2014 to save freshwater migratory fish, to create awareness on the public about the huge efforts being carried out by thousands of organizations around the world to connect people and share experiences. And this is our dream, our vision, free flowing rivers full of fish. Many European countries have forgotten the original state of the rivers, how productive they were just a hundred years ago and not anymore. Why? One of the main reasons is river fragmentation. In the last project we work on, Amber, as Carlos said before, we discovered the real dimension of the problem in Europe. We collected for the very first time in history all available river barriers inventories, coming up with 605,000 barriers. And actually that number is far from reality because most of the inventories were incomplete. The real number is closer to 1.2 million barriers, which means an average of one barrier every two kilometers. We have the most fragmented rivers in the world and at least 100,000 of these barriers are not being used anymore. I would personally think it's the number is much higher. And 30,000 30, hydropower plants need to renew their license. Each time I show these numbers, I get the same questions by the public. Is something being done to improve this situation? Well, the most shocking part is that there is a lot being done and nobody was talking about this until five years ago when we started a dam removal Europe movement. There are great projects being carried out in many European countries, a lot of experience to learn from, and no one was connected and sharing all these efforts and success. And this is our goal, to make dam removal a measure that is seen as a useful business. We want to replicate demonstration sites and showcases all over Europe. And for example, these two great cases you can see here at your left, a four meter tall weir uh, removal along with another nine weir removals in Parma River, Estonia. Thanks to those 10 weir removals, Estonia achieved the biggest watershed opening ever done in Europe. More than 3,000 kilometers opened to the sea, connected again. And to the right, the biggest dam removed in Europe in the Saloon River, Normandy, France, last year. 35 meter tall hydropower dam, which energy production will be replaced by three windmills. 
And there is something that I would really like to specially highlight on this. Dams, weirs, and culverts are not only being removed because of environmental safety and liability reasons, also for economic reasons. Maintaining useless or low productive dams is a very expensive, uh, spe sorry, it's a very expensive uh, thing to do. And uh, like Massachusetts government explains very well in their economic impacts analysis from 2011, 13, and 15, the economic outputs of restoration projects are equal or greater than road or bridge construction. So we're not talking only about environment, nature, and happy butterflies and pink flowers. No, this is also a huge motor to activate economy. And this is one of the things we'll do, the application of the European Union Biodiversity Strategy 2030. And actually our foundation and partners are very proud to have been part of the strategy outcomes. But if we really want to succeed, it's crucial we communicate and inform people well. Until now, all this information was shared inside the scientific world. But we cannot keep working and making so much effort without citizens understand why this is so important, why we are putting so much energy and money on this. And actually, this is what we do in our foundation, connecting, facilitating, and sharing all this information, not only within the professional networks, but also to create awareness among the citizens using their communication platforms, radio programs, magazines, TVs, documentaries, and comics. And here you can see two clear examples. A radio program in the BBC talking about why removing dams is something positive. And to the right, program Planet Earth, who contacted us to be able to make a dam removal segment in their trilogy. And this is exactly what we did for Life Connect project. I would say Life Connect is uh, one of the best examples in Europe, which shows how important it is to have all stakeholders working together, hydropower, county boards, citizens, scientists, and also how the project is being communicated. And as a good example, we as partners from Life Connect help connect and share the Mariberg weir removal, the one that Johan just explained during a live streaming webinar. And I will show you now a one minute video which summarizes the two hours event we celebrated. Hopefully you can see the video correctly. In this video, scientists explain the environmental side of the project. Hydropower experts explain why they were also on board on this project, why this was important. A local company who were doing the removals works told us about the start of their company and the positive progress they were experiencing. And in this webinar, there were 500 people in the audience from 47 countries, from all continents, and from different sectors. So we had environmental administrations, companies, research centers, universities, NGOs, students, journalists, which is very important, communication companies, and angling associations. But the most important thing, actually, in my opinion, uh, happened after the webinar because local organizations who attended this webinar later on shared this information with their local people within their local network. So actually, the information reached much, much farther. So this is, uh, uh, I think that this project can be really taken as a good example for European countries and the rest of the planet. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pao. And I'm also very, very grateful that in the meantime, I see quite a lot of interesting questions coming up from our participants. It's a pity I cannot see your face and try to grasp also the emotions and the feelings uh, behind the questions. But what I notice is that, that there is a lot of interest about the Life Connect project. And uh, Mr. Tillman, if you allow me, I would pick up a question that I think you are the best place to answer. A participant is uh, asking us, but how many other hydropower plants are planned to be removed in the future of Uniper? Uh, allow me immediately to say, uh, we sympathize a lot for, with what you have been saying, Mr. Tillman. We also see that hydropower in certain situations, of course, has a very important role to play also as a clean energy. But still, as you see, participants would like to challenge you on more barriers. Is there something in the pipeline you can share with us? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, 
as I mentioned, this project uh, that I was talking about was rather drastic and, and uh, an exemption, I would say, uh, as we removed the whole uh, dam and with that also renewable energy source. Uh, we are facing in Sweden now a realizing of more than 2,000 hydropower plants in the next, next uh, 20 years, which is a great challenge, not only for the operator, but also for the envir environment, of course, and authorities involved. Uh, how, how this will be done and what measures will be uh, carried out in the end is, is still to be seen. But I would say that uh, dam removals uh, when it comes to hydropower is an exception that might be used, but not in a very big extent uh, as we need uh, the power source and, um, and the regulatory capacity. Uh, so mainly I would say that uh, the uh, measures will focus on improved connectivity and restore habitats where that is possible and motivated. Because as Kim mentioned, we need the habitats also if there should be any, any uh, point uh, improving the connectivity. So I hope that answers the question. It, it certainly does. I have her in my view, it also sparks wider questions because, as you know, in the framework of the European Green Deal, the Commission is working intensively on a wider clean energy agenda, looking at different sources of clean energy. And I suppose that reflections are very much ongoing in the EU deeper energy, uh, Sweden as well. Uh, in that respect, uh, I mean, how much does your company continue to rely very much on hydropower generation as the most important, say, kind of uh, clean energy source uh, over the next decade, 20 years? Can you share with us any perspective in that respect? And how much are you thinking to switch to other sources progressively? Uh, well, I hope I understand your question. Um, as I showed in one of my, of my slides, uh, hydropower is going to be a very big part of the energy system in Sweden, Scandinavia, also in the future, uh, while uh, nuclear power will be decreased uh, in the years to come and uh, at least partly be, be um, um, compensated by uh, uh, more and more wind power. Uh, which is good, of course, as it's, it is a renewable energy source, but also it means that it, uh, it uh, is a problem for balancing the grid and uh, to have uh, generation every time of the day or the year when it's needed. And this is why hydropower will play such an important role in future as a regulatory capacity. Much, Mr. Tillman. Now, uh, other questions that I think, in particular, Pau could be particularly well placed to answer, but also other panelists, please. They relate, for example, to how can citizens best be involved in Blue Rivers project in the most effective manner? A question that I would also combine with another one from another participant who says, "Well, how do you really deal at best with, you know?" public opinions, lack of knowledge sometimes about the negative impacts of dams. I think we all understand it's important to have clean energy. Uh, not everyone understand ecosystem disruption, problems linked also to methane emissions. Uh, how can we become effective in our narrative? So how to engage and how to become more effective in narrative? Maybe, Paul, you want to give it a go and then if other colleagues want to intervene, please. Thank you. Well, uh, it's a very broad um, question uh, to answer, but I would say that it's crucial, it's crucial that citizens engage, get engaged in their uh, municipality. It's, it's important to show their interest and to uh, start the conversation. Uh, if they, if, if, I mean, if we don't, um, how do you say, if we don't ask to our communicators, newspapers, TVs, politicians to talk about this and care about this, it's difficult to uh, achieve it. So I think the best thing they can do is always directly ask and um, imply and, uh, and ask for, for these uh, applications in their municipality, in their region. That's the best way. I don't know if another colleague has another better answer. Any of the other panelists who would like to intervene on this one? Uh, well, I see 
Mr. Tillman, would you like to take the floor very briefly so that participants are aware? No? Uh, did you did you address that to, to me? Sorry, maybe I misread. I thought I saw a, a reply to you in the in to one of the questions submitted. I thought it was related to the one to the topic we are discussing about citizens' involvement and you know uh, raising awareness about so to say cost and benefits out of dam removals, implications for the environment, but of course to be measures against the, the benefits of clean energy production. Never mind. Let's move to another question. But still, Mr. Tillman, I'm afraid you're very much in the spotlight. A participant is asking us, what was the main reason for uh, Uniper to establish a 1 billion euro fund? If you can clarify. Um, first of all, I should say that it's not a fund raised only by Uniper, but also the other bigger power companies in Sweden. And the reason is to fulfill the national strategy that I uh, quickly mentioned, uh, which means that all uh, uh, the power plants in Sweden, there are more than 2,000 hydropower plants in Sweden, should be realized in the next coming years. And to enable this, not only for the bigger companies, but also for the smaller operators, which have maybe a weaker uh, resources, uh, the power company companies or the power industry in Sweden has raised this fund to enable this and to finance measures in all these uh, rivers with hydropower. Uh, and this is because we acknowledge this, this strategy as a, as a good strategy to face both the climate challenge and the challenge to reach the uh, objectives when it comes to ecology in the rivers. So that's the short answer. Well, thank you very much. Um, there is a bit of a more technical question that has also come in. Um, maybe uh, Professor Arstrup or Professor Sdeleanis could uh, reply to it. A colleague is asking, uh, uh, well, LT rivers need, uh, uh, in his understanding, alternate pools and rifles, shallows. And do you consider that river restoration projects always need indeed to work on those as well? Any practical take, maybe also from the Danish experience, Professor uh, Armstrong? Well, uh, of course, river restoration is, is in a broad context, something that you need to take into consideration all kinds of habitats that are necessary for the fish. And yes, rivers are very diverse and very different. And some of them has a sort of rifle and pool uh, distribution and have meandering and others are different. It, it certainly depends on the area. I work mainly in lowland rivers where we have meandering and we have these rifle and pools. I can certainly also say that uh, a lot of the rivers, if you don't, essentially this is a political decision, but if you're serious about biodiversity laws, about reinstating some of the river habitat, you cannot do that without sacrificing some of these, what do you call, anthropogenic goods that we have, whether that be hydropower or fish farms or water mills or whatever. Uh, it's pretty clear to me that if we're taking the energy out of the water and use it for something else, the river will miss it at some point. So there has to be something, you have to give something back to nature in order to achieve the goals in terms of biodiversity and certainly in terms of the water frame rectorating, in my opinion. Thank you very much, Professor. And since you have the line, a question to you, because you have come with a very practical example, and then also again to the colleagues of Life Connect. Do you have a quantified cost benefit analysis of the Danish river restoration project? For us, it will be very interesting to quantify this. And this, and this is also the question for the colleague of Life Connect later on. Cost benefit quantification of river restoration. Yes, uh, we do have something. The problem is in terms of that, in terms of when you do a cost benefit analysis, a lot of these ecological effects, a lot of these uh, uh, um, uh, benefits to society is very difficult to put sort of in monetary terms. And uh, it, I believe it's called uh, uh, externalities if you do a cost benefit analysis. So it, it is difficult to put an actual monetary value on it. We can do it for fishing. We can do it for the angling community, how much they pay. We have tried to do that on 
sea trout, again, as I said, sort of the national of, of sports fish here in Denmark. And river restoration as such, uh, a kilometer of restored river back to good habitat quality in terms of that represents uh, I can't remember, but I think it's 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 several thousand uh, Danish kroners per year per kilometer in societal need just from angling alone. Uh, so, and if we can take the example from, from River Villestro, usually we have it saying we have a calculation that estimates that one kilo of sea trout will uh, generate an income about uh, two thousand five hundred Danish kroners, which is about was that. Uh, in euros for other people, that'll be, uh, what is that, 500, 400 euros, something like that. And uh, essentially, that in Viva Real Estate, we have one of these fish per four meters. And of course, it won't be catched all of them, but you can quickly calculate that if 10 or 20 or 30% of these fish are getting caught, that will amount to quite a lot of money. Uh, or a societal income uh, uh, by as a consequence of the river restoration we did. And one thing that's also important in terms of that is that it's a one-term investment. A lot of these restoration, if you if you do the restoration properly, probably, then you don't have to do anything else. You essentially just leave it, and that income will come to you every year. The fish are dumb enough to continue this life cycle every single year in the years to come. So it's not about if you have a building, you have to depreciate it. It's going to it's going to wear down. If you have a machine, it's going to wear down. If you let the nature handle it itself, it's just going to continue in principle indefinitely until the end of the world. Much professor, and I know what is my next destination for fishing. <laughs> Yeah, I've already my plans. We only have three minutes left. And I would like to ask one specific question on uh, river restoration in cities. A participant who is asking us, well, what about urban areas? And think of River Seine in Brussels. Professor Carlo de Leanis, you have been the most positive of all of us, looking about so many obsolete barriers. But how do we act at best in cities? Floor is yours, please, two minutes. Yes, of course, this is very timely and very important because 76% of the Europeans are living in cities now. So the only rivers they are going to have access to are city rivers. Obviously, city rivers are not going to be pristine. It's not going to be possible to achieve in city rivers the same sort of environmental standards that you would achieve in a river with no, with no people, but they can all get better. And we believe this is a very, very important type of river restoration that we would like to see being developed in the future. Um, obviously, there are going to be some constraints and uh, it's going to cost uh, money, but uh, in this post-COVID-19 Europe, it is essential that uh, people who live in cities, uh, most Europeans, that they should have access to rivers that flow, the rivers that they can enjoy, and the rivers that are not um, uh, hidden away, as has happened in many big cities. So absolutely, we believe that city rivers, urban rivers, are an extremely important type of uh, river restoration projects that will be become even more important in the future. Thank you so much, Professor. Mr. Olson, may I invite you to put in the chat a reference, if there is any, on where to find a cost-benefit quantification of the Life Connect project? Is there one? You have three seconds to reply. One. Absolutely. We have done some, you know, Life Connect is it's a very young project, but we do have numbers of uh, what we expect to get after the restoration measures have been done. So well, let, it's a continuing story. Well, I trust the data can be shared with the participants in an event. So on this, allow me to conclude because time is running. And I think we have captured some really important messages. I would like to highlight one of the last ones, notably that we're talking here about a type of investment that is there to almost self-sustain itself, that is the result of a collective engagement that materializes the type of green and more sustainable transformation that we need, which should not come at the expenses of, you know, cutting sources of very much needed clean energy generation, but should be part of a picture of 
collective transformation. We're talking about an area where we see so much untapped potential because as Professor uh, Garcia de Leandi said that at the beginning, over 150,000 obsolete barriers in our rivers, so much to do. We have witnessed so much citizens' engagement in the past about uh, uh, beach cleanups and similar activities. I see a brilliant future for working together on a very vivid, very practical agenda of bringing our rivers back to free flowing. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm sorry we have to interrupt right now. It has been a pleasure to be together, though at a distance. Have a good day.